pleasure to be here. I did have some hope to be uh, giving a talk in that lovely library upstairs, but, uh, but I'm sure this is going to work out much better. Right. Um, I guess credit rating agencies or bond rating agencies, as they used to be known, uh, are a fascinating puzzle. Um, I guess largely unnoticed, as I say here. I, I, I remember when I first started to look at them, um, but I suppose before debt crises in the 1990s, a lot of people did react as, as if they were a rather boring topic. I have no problems on that score today. Um, We've had a whole series of crises involving the credit rating agencies. Uh, I guess in my book I start with the Orange County uh, of California crisis back in the early 1990s. Uh, and then of course Enron um, was uh, a very exciting event with all its special purpose vehicles and so on. Uh, uh, get its, getting itself fouled up over those back in 2001. And now, of course, the global financial crisis has made these institutions no notorious, really. But I don't think all of these events have really increased public, or dare I say it, the policy uh, understanding of these institutions much. In fact, frankly, I think one of the astonishing things, maybe this is true of all researchers and universities, but one of the astonishing things for me has been to watch, I think, the level of futility in terms of debates in the US and in Europe about these agencies um, since the Enron event. I mean, it really is quite an astonishing black hole, I think, intellectually. Now, I think we can identify problems. Uh, my title is, after all, Problems with Credit Rating Agencies. We, I think we can identify problems with the agencies at a couple of levels. Um, one of which I think is largely neglected. Much of the discussion of the agency's problems, I will contend, is not well founded. Uh, in conclusion, I'm going to suggest uh, that one interpretation of all the controversy over the agency's role in the crisis that we are still experiencing, I'm just looking at my uh, International Herald Tribune will comment about the future of Spain and the possible future of the Euro, so this crisis is not by any means over. Um, one interpretation uh, of the controversy over the agency's role in this business that is continuing uh, is that, they, that, that targeting the agency serves political ends, and I've written an article indeed to that effect. But despite all of this, despite all this hot air, all this noise, all this policy churning, despite the, I don't know how many uh, uh, PDFs of reports, especially from the Europeans, I have um, downloaded and attempted to look at in the last three years, uh, despite all the evidence at congressional committees in the United States, um, my contention remains that little substantive change will emerge. The business model won't be fundamentally changed. The analytical model will not be fundamentally changed. That may be consoling to you who, who think the state is an interfering nuisance in, po in economics, or it may not be. <clears throat> Here's an outline of what I'm going to say. Let's start off with a little bit about where the agencies actually come from and what it is that I think they do. Then I'm going to talk about um, sort of process of capital market development very briefly, and I guess financial innovation, which seems to me to be the background to our current excitement over the agencies. Then I'm going to talk about what I perceive to be the major um, key problems in the public debate about the agencies. Now, by, by no means am I comprehensive here. I'm not trying to get all of the uh, um, uh, debates in the policy literature, all the debates in the academic literature, many of which are very interesting and thoughtful and substantial. Um, I'm trying to target, I suppose, the ones that seem to be motivating 
the policy system the most. I suppose that's a fair way to understand it, what I'm trying to do. Um, and these things have really made me quite angry because they do largely seem to me to be not very well conceived and yet very persuasive. It's, it's intriguing, isn't it, in academic life, how you, and policy life for that matter, how, how the most vacuous ideas sometimes become the most influential. We must charge for universities, but we must not charge somehow for primary schools or secondary schools. Hmm. Yeah, where do you draw the line between public goods and private goods? Yeah, it's arbitrary, it seems. Perhaps not. Uh, after considering these key problems, I'm going to then I'm then going to problematize the problems uh, with some discussion of them, and hopefully, I will convince you, some of you, that uh, they are not very convincing. Um, then I'm going to do my own <coughs> account of problems, uh, problems two, then offer some conclusions and obviously there'll be further reading listed for those of you who wish to pursue this issue. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start off with, uh, with where the agencies come from and what it is I think that they actually do. Well, I mean, they are American institutions, first and foremost, and I appreciate that there are, there's now quite a feisty Chinese institution, and there have certainly been institutions and in, uh, agencies in Japan and Malaysia and, uh, and so on for about 20, 25 years now. But, in, you know, this, all this really comes from the US, New York City, unsurprisingly. Uh, it all starts, I think, really as a reflection of Western expansion of the United States. Uh, incredible opportunities for investors, typically, of course, European investors, British investors and continental investors, uh, who didn't have any knowledge of what was going on there. So, of course, data compendiums were produced by people like Henry Varnum Poor. And these, these compendiums really exist in the context of an information problem, the US government didn't have any reliable uh, data gathering, certainly in this part of the continental United States at the time. So, um, you know, again, there is a kind of uh, vacuum, I think, that um, poor in particular is, is trying to fill. Now, um, in 1909, Moody's starts to issue ratings. Now, I should add here that uh, <laughs> Moody's first company actually goes bankrupt. You won't find this on Moody's Investors uh, webpage. <laughs> uh, I think I discovered this in a speech by Moody that an ex-Moody's employee gave to me many years ago. Uh, but no, the first company went bankrupt in the 1907 financial crisis, a crisis similar in some respects to the crisis that we've just experienced. Um, and I think it was that crisis that really stimulated um, Moody to go for to actually think about the issue of ratings themselves, to think about the not just gathering data as poor had, poor's had, but uh, or standard statistics had, but to start to actually offer evaluations as well. That seems to me to be the crucial thing. Um, now, here's an important point. Okay, so we've got Moody's offering ratings in 1909. We've got S&P, Standard Poor's offering them five, six, seven years later. Um, interestingly, by the early 1920s, municipal bonds issued uh, in the United States must, in order to sell, in order to clear on the market, have a Moody's rating. Right? This is not a reflection of any state activity or government activity or anything of that, that nature. It is a reflection, I think, of um, <coughs> an efficient solution to a problem in the market. Uh, Moody's was offering that solution, and that really is the basis of Moody's franchise, I think. So for those of, uh, uh, <coughs> those of the sort of rating fraternity or rating academic fraternity who think that it was a, uh, a government rule in 1975 called the, uh, the NRSRO rule, Nationally Recognised Statistical Rating Organisation rule, um, that actually created the rating franchise, they need to read their history books because uh, you know, the whole rating system begins uh, in the municipal uh, world, the world of building bridges and dams and sewerage systems and things like that. And it, that is where uh, Moody's acquires um, 
its business, really, or builds its business. Uh, it doesn't happen in 1975. Mm -hmm. um, so to, I think to understand rating uh, uh, you know, as a, somehow a regulatory license given by the state um, you know, fails to account for uh, the success early on. However, governments do indeed stimulate the process as we move forward in time. Uh, first example of that um, is in 1931, when I think the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency in the United States starts to require uh, pension funds to use ratings um, uh, in order to invest. And I could draw a distinction between speculative ratings and investment grade ratings. So, I mean, in a sense, the government starts to use and take advantage of this uh, already highly successful system um, <coughs> to deal with, obviously, some of the crises uh, and tensions that it, it was dealing with at the time, similar, I guess, to some of the crises and tensions we have to deal with right now. So I think that's a little bit about where the agencies come from and what, what it is they do. I mean, I guess, you know, um, they're big organisations to really to issue a bond unless you're Ferrari or, or you're some other name brand Italian uh, company in Europe, in most of developed Asia and certainly in North America one needs to have a credit rating. Um, I think certainly a beginning to understanding these institutions comes from a rationalist understanding of what they do, that they help to solve an information problem right, between buyers and sellers in markets, capital markets. Um, but I think there's more to the story, and hopefully I'll be able to illustrate that. I think there is a, um, a constructed or uh, orchestrated side to this as well. It's not simply, uh, <coughs> it's not simply like a uh, part that one would stick into one's car to fix. It's not simply a functional argument. There's also um, an historical and, um, I don't know, behavioural dimension to all of this. There is, of course, an, a third rating agency founded at this time called Fitch Ratings, but I haven't really talked about this very much for the, for the simple reason that it's not very successful. Yeah. And it's not very successful, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't achieve the same uh, level of eminence or authority that Moody's and S&P uh, achieve very quickly. And, uh, you know, I would argue has never, they have never achieved that. So there is, I think, in this um, story a lot to be said about the issue of authority and knowledge. Um, it's not simply, as I say, a functional account of fulfilling or sort of solving some sort of problem. You can solve that problem well, you can solve it badly. You can solve it well if you're Moody's and you can f be perceived to solve it less well if you're Fitch and therefore be less successful. Right, now disintermediation. I think this is where a lot of our difficulties come from, not just in relation to rating agencies but in relation to finance generally. Um, we're all used to dealing with banks and we think banks are very important and meaningful institutions. However, I would suggest to you that they aren't really. Uh, uh, institutions that we call banks today increasingly aren't the banks that our grandparents knew. And that's because we all are living through a period in which direct financing or financing from capital markets has become increasingly important. And direct uh, financing from banks to corporates to governments is just so ridiculously expensive and unattractive that either the banks offered as a loss leader and don't make any money on it at all, or they're only able to uh, make loans to very poor credits. And of course, lending to poor credits encourages good credits even further to go elsewhere because not only do they have to pay for the cost of the bank, they have to pay for the cost of all the bad loans that the bank has made. And I think, you know, frankly, folks, here's the explanation for, you know, we, we can talk about flows from China and all sort of stuff like Martin Wolf, but to me, this is the most profound explanation for the crap we've had to deal with in the last three years because here um, is the desperation of a whole lot of financial institutions in this country, in the United States and in Europe uh, the desperate effort to get in on uh, the credit markets uh, to actually be able to offer finance as cheaply as they offer uh, before they become outmoded like dinosaurs. 
Anyway, part of this process of disintermediation is uh, a move of the agencies themselves outside the United States uh, to anticipate growth in capital markets in Europe and Asia. You know, um, Asia financial crisis, what happens afterwards? Oh, we don't like those banks, they're a big mistake. Let's get capital markets in here. So the agencies are criticised for their role in bringing about the Asian financial crisis, but what, is, what does the Asian financial crisis bring? But growth for the agencies. Similar story, frankly, can be told about now. Um, when you have the TARP, when you have uh, financial uh, um, recovery systems in the United States, the Fed itself has encouraged the use of rating agencies in that process. So, you know, for capital market growth basically equals rating industry growth. Um, and in a con you know, now more than ever, uh, a bank which is increasingly acting as a market participant, not as a authority or gatekeeper of finance, uh, wants to get in on this, on this capital market and politicians and policymakers are aware uh, therefore, they have to stimulate the growth of capital markets. They have to create, provide appropriate institutions for those markets. So what does that mean? It means a great and fertile environment for capital market growth. Uh, sorry, for rating agency growth. Now, of course, part of this, very recently, has been the hunt for yield in the wake of the uh, 2000 stock market crash and the subsequent reduction of interest rates, this desperate sending of capital, first of all, off to Asia, and then internally uh, in Europe and North, North America into things like asset-backed securities, right? So all of that's been part of uh, the process too. So financial innovation as well as um, institutional transformation has been central to the, uh, the extension um, of the role of these institutions. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about key problems. Now, these are not the problems that I think are the problems, but they are the problems that everybody else thinks are the problems. So, there we go. Um, certainly there's an established talk or chatter about the agencies going back 30 years or so. Um, so the, talk, you know, the, the conversation that we've had about the agencies in the last three years in the media and in the journals and so on is nothing new. Uh, the standard critique of the past was that the agencies were backward looking uh, and therefore were regarded as too slow. More recently in the 1990s, uh, the agencies, especially Moody's, engaged in quite aggressive sort of market opening activities, if you want to call it that, by issuing unsolicited ratings. So instead of, you know, negotiating with a, I don't know, an Italian food company to, um, uh, to issue a rating on a, on a, on a bond issue, uh, Moody, Moody's just went ahead and uh, did a rating unsolicited, in an unsolicited way. And of course this stimulated uh, U.S. Justice Department action, which sort of legal solution, that action was unsuccessful. Um, I mean, traditionally, uh, I think Moody's and S&P have, have stood behind a defence of First Amendment rights in the United States, i.e. free speech. And I think that really, you know, it's interesting, I think that really speaks to a lot of the problems here. These are not actually financial institutions, you know, they're not. They're not actually investment advisors either. They are, you know, at some level, they're a bunch of journalists, you know, that's what they are. And I think that, <laughs> that helps them, but it also, it obviously hinders the policy system's response to them because it, it just stumbles over this, I think. Can you, 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 yes. Well, I think the concern was that um, Moody's was behaving contrary to the Sherman Antitrust Act, that it was, an, uh, it was a monopolist, it was using its powers to coerce people in the market. And they were unsuccessful. Now, um, another thing that occurred, Fitch, which had, uh, sort of existed, I think, from about 1920, um, but would sort of go dormant for years on end, a bit like sort of some car companies or, I don't know, universities or whatever, I don't know. Um, 
publishers, um, relaunched itself uh, in the early 90s. And there were concerns, I think, mm -hmm. uh, rightly, I think, uh, perhaps, that uh, this might lead to rating shopping. Because if you are generally required to produce two, uh, or have two ratings on your, on your bond, and there's a third agency that can offer ratings, then um, certainly there is the potential for game playing there as Fitch tries to get more a greater share of the market. I did actually have a Fitch executive say to me, I think she was going to retire fairly soon, <laughs> that that indeed was their business strategy, was to, was to rate uh, about one click uh, more generously than Moody's and S&P. So. Now, um, though the sort of background concerns, I guess, rating shopping, unsolicited rating, this kind of backwardness, if you will, historical view of rating. More recently, uh, I think, with rating crises, uh, such as the Asian financial crisis, the Enron bankruptcy, and the global financial crisis that we're experiencing today, I think the concern has been much more about getting it wrong, about missing the ball, about um, you know, not, not, being, not issuing accurate ratings, I suppose. Now, I, I think, um, and there's a lot of sort of vague accusations made about the quality of Moody's staff and, the, you know, and anal the analysis done there and so on. And I guess I don't really want to sort of deal with this particularly seriously because a Moody, uh, sorry, an IMF report in the wake of the Enron, sorry, in the wake of the Asia financial crisis said quite conclusively that these stories were unfounded. I mean, obviously everybody got the Asian financial crisis wrong, you know, including the IMF. Um, and the World Bank, but I mean, I think they, you know, they did, it was quite a serious report uh, at the time, and basically they were just happy to assert or show that um, most of this complaining was in the nature of noise. But I think more recently, uh, in, the, in the case of the global financial crisis, these accusations have morphed into um, something else, into a concern about conflicts of interest. The argument here, of course, which no doubt you've heard again and again, are that the agencies are paid by those whose products they rate. And you know, lo and behold, this was somehow a great revelation and everybody was supposed to run to the hills and panic and so on. Um, and the suggestion, of course, is, is that in relation to the subprime uh, system of asset-backed securities, that the credit rating agencies were happy to rate these things as AAA, despite the fact that they were actually supposedly toxic, right? So this is the claim that the agencies were distorted or perverted by their own pecuniary interests to produce AAA ratings. Right, now, I don't really accept this at all, uh, and I think there are good reasons that you shouldn't accept it as well. Uh, the first of all, the conflict of interest argument, I think, is very problematic. Um, the agencies have been issuing, sorry, have been charging issuers for nearly four decades at the point when the financial crisis starts. Logically, uh, one would ask, why make the argument now, why make the argument in 2007, 2008, when Moody's and S&P had been uh, charging issu issuers for uh, fees for bond issuance or for the ratings of bond, bond issuance from about 1968? I mean, logically, it, it's hard to, given all the other crises and all the other events, um, it does seem a curious claim to suggest uh, that, um, that the conflict of interest only emerges in 2007. It's just very odd, I think. And I think this is precisely the sort of historical level of understanding that is missing from most of the literature about the rating agencies. I think it's chapter two of my book. Uh, but, you know, it really is, I think, missing from most of the economic account and certainly the legal account as well. Um, now, I would say on conflict of interest that conflict of interest are ubiquitous. If there's an, if all the academics in this, offer, in this room uh, face these conflicts of interest themselves in terms of marking students, right? Many expensive degrees at this university and at my university 
Um, prima facie, uh, if the rating, rating agencies have a conflict of interest, so do we. And so do those at private schools and so on and so forth. So I think um, it's how you manage your conflicts of interest that matters. And some of us manage these things well, and I think most universities in the UK ma manage their conflicts of interest very well. Um, there's very little evidence, I think, direct evidence, as opposed to sort of slander and innuendo, that the rating agencies um, manage their uh, conflicts of interest any worse. Right? So, I mean, there's just an identification between here's a conflict of interest, here's a scandal, and you know, there's the assumption that there is evidence, and in fact there isn't. I think um, the, one of the uh, rather scandalous uh, um, rating agency hearings uh, conducted um, in the US Congress involved uh, investigators actually going into the rating agencies and gathering data, uh, gathering emails and that sort of thing. And I think one of them, if you recall, refers to you know, if it's a cow, we'll rate it or something like that. Now, it's quite interesting because I read those documents, unlike, I'm sure, the senators and uh, the, most of the people who actually attended that hearing. And um, if you actually read the documents, if you read the, uh, the so-called town hall meeting conducted by Ray McDaniel, the CEO of Moody's Corporation, which owns Moody's Investors Service, one of the things that you'll see is the irony of uh, the SEC and other institutions contacting the agencies and asking them desperately to tell these government agencies how the SEC and the other agencies could actually, uh, or the government generally, the US government generally, could actually reg further regulate the rating agencies. And McDaniel talks about this at length. And of course, needless to say, Henry Waxman, the chair of this committee, doesn't mention this rather revealing fact about the, A, the ineptitude of the US government but also, I think about the, you know, I mean, he, all he wants to highlight <coughs> in this hearing, in these hearings, are, you know, rather fatuous comments by junior analysts, rather than, uh, I think, the, the more key observation, which is um, that actually how you regulate institutions like this, which are, after all, not financial institutions, mm -hmm. which are not investment advisors, how you do that is actually a problem. And I thought, I thought that was very revealing, but of course, as I say, Waxman completely ignores that. It is uh, in uh, the evidence for that particular hearing, but as I say, ignores it. So it instead just wants to highlight the sort of trivia, you know, if it's a cow, we'll rate it and so on. Now, I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding or complete lack of understanding of what it is the agencies were actually doing um, in relation to asset backed securities. Now, I'm not an apologist for the agencies. My book is actually very critical of the agencies. Um, but I do like to get things right. And I, I think that what the agencies were actually rating um, is not what people think that they were rating. Right? Um, people say, you know, how on earth could the agencies rate uh, more um, asset backed securities based on? on houses in East Los Angeles, right? How could they do this? I mean, these are all poor Latinos, blah, 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 you know, ninja loans, yada, yada, yada. We know, we've all heard all this nonsense before. How could this possibly happen, that they would, would come out with AAA ratings? How could they possibly rate these toxic assets as AAA? They're obviously corrupt. They're obviously this, that, and the other thing. Well, you know, that isn't what they're rating. <laughs> they're not actually rating the mortgages. I think that's the point. That's the weird thing about this. This is a, shows, I guess, the, the confusion about asset-backed securities. What they're rating is essentially the, the sort of legal claims that are attached to the hierarchy of tranches in a trust. And the uh, tranches at the top, the AAA tranches, have the strongest legal claim to the stream of income from the trust. And those at the bottom have the weakest claim. Right? And so they set up this hierarchy of credit worthiness of, for different tranches. Now that's actually what was going on, right? It's not like they were rating Latino, you know, unemployed Latino houses in East Los Angeles as AAA and somehow you know, this was some obviously perverted activity. They were, they, were, they were essentially rating a trust and the products of a trust. Right? Most people don't know that, but it is actually quite different from, from what 
people think is going on. Now, <coughs> you could say, well, they got ratings of trusts wrong, didn't they? And I think my response to that one is, well, <coughs> Germain, Randall Germain, new book that's just come out on uh, some global governance and financial markets, has referred to what he calls the great freeze of 2000, 2000, sorry, 2007, 2008. I call it the valuation crisis. Um, this is, of course, the period in which uh, actors in, or, uh, market, uh, actors in financial markets will not transact with each other. LIBOR rate goes through the roof. Essentially, the markets stop. Now, if you think that you could insert that into a financial model that produces a credit rating, or indeed any financial model, good luck to you, right? Everybody missed this. The valuation crisis or great freeze of this time couldn't happen. Talk to Eugene Famer, impossible. You know, asset bubbles don't even exist for him, but certainly the sort of tsunami that we experienced at that time was not within the knowledge parameters of the, the market participants, of their academic commentators, and certainly their policy, uh, policy officials, regulators, and so on. Now, if you think that the rating agencies could have anticipated that, should have anticipated that, I'm afraid I would have to disagree with you. Nobody could, nobody did. Uh, so we had a tsunami. So guess what? That whole system of rating of, of trusts um, and the transfers associated with it ultimately came unstuck. But then it would, wouldn't it? And it seems to me, seems to me that that is a that there is no. If you t you know if you read and you talk to uh, rating officials, and I have done this. There's no way they could possibly have got to this from 2006. I mean, you know, I mean, that just doesn't seem like a reasonable uh, position. And in any case, I mean, these are people who's, who talk about a business cycle, who have a sense, you know, have had a long sense by comparison with most financial market um, commentators of the, the comings and goings, of the, the rise and fall of different industries, the cyclic nature of many industries but it doesn't extend that far, no. Because that's only something that very, I think probably one person at Moody's who was in his late 80s, a kind of chap who would come in half a day a week or something at that point, who had, had, had any memory of, of course, from the 1930s. Because your typical crisis of 87, your crisis in the early 70s, blah, 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 they're not this, right? So I just think that is beyond human knowledge as reflected in what these people do. Okay, so what are, just check the time, so what are the, um, the problems as I see it with credit rating agencies? And I think there are two roles that the agencies have um, that are the most substantive problems, if you like. Now the first is what I call conflict of role. Um, the second is that the agencies work in reproducing what I call in my book the mental framework of orthodoxy, of the orthodox. The, the latter is, is, um, is probably something that is quite critical and, and difficult, but I think the former is a fairly easy concept. Now, I, it really is this, that we need the agencies to act as judges, right? literally. We need them to impose a form of regulation to be quite um, uncompromising, I suppose, in that, as a judge is. Um, at the end of the day, they must make the judgments. Now, unfortunately, with asset-backed securities, that role of being a judge really fell apart, and the agencies became an advocate. So they crossed the bench, and they helped to actually constitute the securities or make, create, or innovate the securities themselves. At this point, uh, in uh, you know, in the years prior to the crisis, the agencies are actually making the securities because they are the most experienced party in terms of advising, essentially, on legal matters, how to form a trust, how to create the trenches, all that sort of stuff. Okay. You know, so, and it made a lot of sense for, for, for the participants in the market who are issuing these um, asset-backed securities to get this advice. You know, you can see why they would do it. But 
um, to me, it really does challenge the role of a judge. And, you know, I said earlier uh, that Moody's and SNP were distinct from Fitch because they had more eminence, they had more epistemic authority, they had a better brand, they were more considered more eminent. You go to Asia, you ask people, do you, what do you think of your Japanese rating agencies? And they go, we like Moody's and SNP. You go, <laughs> you go to Malaysia, you ask them, what do you think of your Malaysian rating agencies? We like Moody's and SNP. In other words, their local agencies are not very good. And the reason they're not very good is because of this. Because it, the, the agencies have this asset, they built up this, it's, you know, it's a major barrier to entry for other agencies. So when the agencies move to actually act on the other side of the bench to start creating essentially financial instruments, they, they really do imperil their franchise. They do imperil this. And I think frankly it's because they did this because most of them were trained as rationalists. They saw, you know, there's an object-subject distinction. I'm, I'm here and I'm observing the financial markets. What they didn't appreciate was that actually much of what they do is founded on having this. And when, you, when you start imperiling that and you start becoming a market uh, uh, maker as well as a market uh, regulator, then you really cast that. And it really is because they didn't understand that, because the SEC didn't understand that, um, because most people don't perceive or conceive of financial markets in these terms. They have a rationalist conception of it as one would of the physical universe. But actually, um, it is this authority that really was the thing that they blew up. And I think that that is what they need to get back, and they need to therefore play the role that they were set up to play. In a sense, they shot themselves in the foot. Now, my second objection is uh, more systemically critical. You might interpret this as sort of the, the macro prudential moment in the talk, if you will. Uh, you know, I quite like that macro. We had a nice macro prudential moment, didn't we, a couple of years ago? It seems to have passed. It seems to have passed, but it was nice. <laughs> um, but I'm going to continue with it. Um, my concern is not that the agencies... See, my, my concern is not... I mean, I guess, you know, here we are in the seminar, right? I don't, think, I don't think the problem really, ultimately, is that the agencies have been the wrong part in the car, you know, that the, or the part's broken or something. I don't think that's the problem, really, here. But, I mean, the, the seminar does imply, you know, that we, we take the part out, we put a new part in, the part, new part's better than the old part, and everything works fine. Now, at some level. Uh, now, I think that that really isn't um, the problem here. My concern is that the agencies really, in the, in the broader sense, have, and I talk about this in the book, of course, they've helped to reproduce what I call a historically and geographically specific model of finance capitalism. And I call it what you will. Some people use neoliberalism. Some people call it all sorts of things, um, which I can't... I can't repeat and get my tongue around, but let's call it a historically and geographically specific model of finance capitalism that we know in the West. This model, of course, has a tendency to extreme financial innovation, um, recurrent asset price bubbles, ask any realtor in the United States, the market's up, the market's down, we're having a crisis, you know, anybody who's ever been to Texas, you'll see the, the sort of the concrete pads, I think this features in one of Neil Ferguson's um, uh, documentaries, you, know, you see the remnants of, of these asset bubbles in terms of concrete pads. In a few years' time, you'll see that in Ireland too, because all those buildings that are up there right now, they'll have burnt out and they'll all be left as a concrete pad underneath. Now that, it seems to me, has left us uh, with a legacy of debt, a uh, legacy of social conflict that is going to take decades potentially to resolve. And that seems to me really to be the problem here. Okay, there is the kind of the, there is the narrower problem. This is the broader problem. This is the problem I think really that I get excited about because it's, you know, this is, the problem really isn't that the agencies don't do their job. It's the, the problem is that they're actually too narrow in terms of the role that they take, right? And this is where, of course, you get into principal agent theory and you say, oh, the, you know, they should be acting as a very narrow agent for their principles and all this sort of stuff. Well, I would say to you, no. That's how we get this, that's how we get this, 
and that's how we get those concrete pads in Texas and in Ireland, right? What we need instead, I think, is a different model uh, of, of principal-agent relations. We have, well, maybe we have to perhaps move to a stakeholder model of that. I'll talk about that. Okay, so let me finish off. First of all, um, these are very obscure institutions. When I started doing them, nobody knew what they were. Everybody knows now. Um, I think this process of disintermediation is the key thing. We have banks on the high street that are not really banks anymore. When I first walked into Citibank in London in 1992, I was welcomed, welcome to Citibank, we don't lend money here. And I think that's the fundamental underlying process here that we need to get our heads around. Um, many of the objections to the work of the agencies, I think, are problematic and don't actually work um, and are, in a sense, uh, moral panics. The agencies have become a useful target for the failures of the last three years. Um, third point is that the sheer complexity, and this is where I don't blame the individuals at Moody's and S&P, but I think the sheer complexity of financial innovation coming out of that process of disintermediation has challenged their valued role as judge. They need to move back to that role as judge. They need to abandon the role as advocate. But in my view, the best judges, this is where we try to make it all work, <laughs> in my view, a really good judge is not the sort of pedantic type but is actually the type of judge who is able to see things, in a, see the law and see a legal case in a broader context. And I think that's precisely what is missing in the historical model of the, of the rating agencies and what we really need to have them evolve to. That is to take on the role of the, take back the role of the judge, yes, but not to take back the role of the pedantic, sort of legalistic judge, if you want to if, if for want of a better word, but to take on the role of the judge who actually does insert some sense of social responsibility or social policy into their judgments, and such judges do exist in this country today and have been lauded as legal giants in decades past in this country <coughs> and elsewhere. And this is precisely the role of the Supreme Court in the United States, it seems to me. Um, and I think we need to, you know, so we need to evolve beyond in a sense, we need to be evolve beyond, beyond the sort of narrow auto parts sort of conception of the agencies to a conception of them taking a much more sort of governing role, a much more uh, productive and creative role. Now, I mean, it's ironic to sort of finish on this note because, of course, that's a very ambitious role, but it seems to me that the, the actual narrow role leads back into the world of... Um, of financial destruction that we've just come out of. Thank you.